So first of all, I wanted to get a sense, or we as a group wanted to get a sense of who's in the room and what uh, a little bit of your, um, uh, where you're coming from on this topic. First, we thought we would do a little bit about where you're coming from literally or the reverse. So can you raise your hand if this is your first time in Panama? Wow, almost everyone. <laughs> Please raise your hand if it is your first time in Latin America. Lots of people. Excellent, especially our African colleagues. Excellent. Um, please raise your hand if you work with legal actors or you are yourself a jurist, a lawyer, or so on. So about half of you, okay. Uh, please raise your hand if you work on the issue of sexual violence. Maybe two thirds of you, okay. Please raise your hand, it's only two more questions. If you use feminism as a lens for your work. If you use feminism as a lens for your work. About maybe 20% of you, okay. And then this is a multi-phased question. So please raise your hand if you, please raise both hands if you feel that you have a lot of experience around accountability to children. Is that something you've done a lot on over your career? Both hands up. That's, down here is it up. This is up. Both hands up, okay? Keep them up, keep them up. Please raise one hand if you have some experience. Okay, most of you have some. And then those who don't have their hand up feel they're fairly new to the topic. Okay, great, thank you. Well, thanks for joining us. Thank you for spending your next hour looking at the topic. Over the last um, three days, I've really been struck at the level of interest there is um, and different kinds of commitment to being more accountable to children uh, in humanitarian settings. As you're probably all aware, the Alliance, one of the Alliance goals in the current strategy is that all humanitarian programs are accountable to children, <clears throat> excuse me, and ensure their meaningful and equitable participation. So we've set the bar high, we're going to have to continue to drive both within our own sector and also obviously as leads across the humanitarian world on, um, on making that a reality. Also in the strategy, we undertook to share learning and knowledge on accountable procedures and initiatives. So obviously this workshop is one of those ways that we're moving forward uh, on that with the presenters who I'll introduce you to quite sh shortly. And the presentations are quite disparate, I think, like our approach to accountability. There's lots of effective ways that we need to um, be engaging uh, to ensure that systems and uh, our ways of working are more accountable to the children who we serve. All of our speakers, as you'll see, are pushing the systems that should be protecting crisis affected children to be more effective and accountable to those very children. Senidia uh, Bagayoko will take us to West Africa and look at the protection and education systems that she's working with there. Uh, Professor Mercy Oke Chinda will champion the need to strengthen the legal system to better protect internally displaced girls against sexual and gender-based violence uh, in Nigeria. Uh, and then finally, Daniela Esquera Suarez will provide an examination of accountability through our own case management systems for children on the move here in Latin America. So in preparing for this session, it became clear to me the multiple, uh, the multifaceted nature of what we um, are needing to be doing. Um, and we'll be looking at some of those systems, as I said, that help us to strengthen uh, the actual initiatives around accountability and our advocacy and championing of that cause. So before I bring our first speaker on stage, we wanted to turn the floor over to you immediately about why you're here. Why are you giving this topic 60 minutes uh, of some precious time? There's lots of other good sessions happening. 
You'll see that there are some sticky notes on your table and there should be some pens around as well. And we would ask you to write down on the sticky note, each of you individually, what is one question you are asking yourself or perhaps you would like to ask the speakers about using systems to better protect children and to be better accountable for their protection. So we'll take maybe two minutes and then my kind colleague who also has pens if you need one uh, will be collecting them. Rania will come around and collect those questions from you. Great, feel free to continue to work on the question and just give a little wave if you, or maybe you have another question uh, over, over the time. So I will introduce our first speaker. Uh, Senidia Bagayoko is a protection and gender expert with advanced degrees from Sciences Po and the University of Sorbonne in France. She has worked with civil society organizations, international NGOs, and UN agencies, and is now the International Rescue Committee's Adolescent Girls Specialist on the INSPIRE project, which she will tell us about. So, Sanidia, welcome, and we will get underway. Um, thank you, Joanna, and good morning, everyone. Um, it's really an honor for me to be here today discussing such a crucial topic as accountability to children. Um, I know that over the past few days we have been discussing a lot about accountability to children and how we can further this. Um, but I hope that from the, le the learning that we will share today, we will be, we will be able to provide you with more um, insight and different perspective and how we can collectively achieve more accountability to our children. So as, as Joanna mentioned, um, I work for the IRC as an adolescent girl specialist for a specific project that is called IGNITE. Um, and I would like to tell you more about it today. So IGNITE stands for Inspiring Girls and Grassroots Networks for Inclusive and Transformative Education. It is a three-year project that is funded by the French Development Agency, um, and it started in 2023, last year, and will end in 2026. So the project is led in consortium by four partners, um, the IRC, so the International Rescue Committee, um, the Partnership for African uh, Social and Governance Research, so PASGER, and they are Pan-African organization conducting um, research in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. We are also working with the Rene Moat Foundation, um, which is an organization working in the Middle East. And finally, um, Urgent Action Fund for Africa, uh, which is also a Pan-African uh, feminist grant-making organization. So they provide funding to local organizations, women rights organizations. And the aim of IGNITE is really to empower adolescent girls and advanced gender transformative education and protection across seven countries in Africa and in the Middle East. Um, so those countries are Burkina Faso, Cameroon, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, um, Nigeria, and then Ethiopia. In the Middle East, we have Jordan and Lebanon. So for those of you who wonder, the, the objective of the project is really to support um, feminist local organizations, women rights organizations, as well as youth-led organizations in, dr in driving gender transformative education, as well as the protection um, and empowerment of adolescent girls in all their diversity. So we strive to do so in different ways. Um, the first one is the provision of flexible funding to local organizations. Um, so we, I think we all know that uh, grassroots organizations, local organizations, especially the ones that are led by women, the ones that um, identify themselves as feminist organization, really struggles when it comes to accessing flexible funding and funding that is uh, sustainable for them. So within IGNITE, we have been really working um, in providing these organizations that are doing amazing work on the ground with funding that is um, flexible, that they can use to implement projects, but also that they can use to develop their organizational capacity. 
Um, the second component is really on capacity sharing um, and experience sharing. I think uh, we tend to refer to this as capacity building, but within Ignite, we have really tried to move. We are really trying to move forward from capacity building and calling it more capacity sharing, where we share expertise um, with the organization, uh, both at the technical level, but also at the um, at the organizational level. Um, and we are doing we are doing so by also providing them with space for them to share their expertise, for them to share the learnings that they have. Um, so um, this is the second component for the project. And then finally, we are also conducting research and learning to provide um, evidence to build advocacy efforts for adolescent girls, but as well for local organizations. Um, so this is a brief overview of the project. Uh, don't worry, this is not a session about localization. I will, um, I will tackle like accountability, but I wanted to give you a brief overview of the project. And as we discuss accountability today um, to children, I'm really looking forward to sharing more learnings from Ignite on how we have been trying to be more accountable for girls, adolescent girls in particular. And I'm also looking forward to learning from the expertise that is present within the room. Thank you. Thanks, Anidia. I'm going to put you on the spot straight away to talk a little bit more about working with civil society organizations and their understanding of accountability and, and how kind of concretely you're, you're unpacking that with adolescent girls. Yes, thank you, Joanna, for the question. So within Ignite, we have been trying to be more accountable toward adolescent girls in different ways. Um, as many of you have gathered, the first one is really toward um, localization or localization efforts. Um, I think we all know that localization is a strategic priority for the Alliance, but it's also a key um, pillar or step, stepping stone if we want to further more accountability toward children. And so this is what we have been trying to do within Ignite. We have been trying to support and promote um, locally driven initiatives led by women rights organizations, feminist organizations, youth led organizations, because oftentimes these organizations are the ones that uh, really are close to the communities. They know better the nuances of the context. They know better the needs of the, the girls and the children. They are more able to connect. Um, so they're more able to connect with children, they're more able to connect with girls and engage them. And this is why we have decided to take this route uh, when it comes to achieving accountability toward adolescent girls. Um, so to give you some concrete example, um, right now, as I've said, the project started last year. So we are still in uh, the early stages. Right now we are currently um, selecting um, the organizations with whom we are going to work with. And in this selection process, we have been really trying to ensure and prioritize local organizations that have engaged um, girls in the design of their projects and that have set up processes to ensure girls' participation um, throughout the project life cycles. Um, to give you some hope and positive examples, we have seen um, some local organization really tapping into existing networks of girls with whom they have been working before through previous projects. And they have reached out to them when they were designing their proposal for Ignite and they have co-created um, the project together. So this is really inspiring for us and it shows that um, accountability towards children right from the design and child participation is possible. And if local organization can do it, um, we should be able to support them in doing so. Um, another example um, or something that we plan to do really is um, once the organizations are on board, uh, we are really working toward providing them with the support to strengthen their existing um, child participation and accountability mechanisms and acknowledge that they already have things that are working and our role is not to create new tools or to, um, yeah, our role is not to create new tools, but more so to orient them toward um, accessible information and to ensure that um, the work that they're doing, uh, we are supporting and elevating them through, yeah, capacity sharing on child participation 
um, safeguarding inclusion of diverse girls, as well as the different ways they can achieve accountability in their specific context. I think I still have some time, so I'll continue. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention is really um, our cross-sectoral work as well. As you may have understood, this is both an education project and a child protection project. And um, I believe that by working across child protection and education, as well as empowerment of adolescent girls, we are really providing them with a more holistic, holistic response. And by doing so, we are in some ways being more accountable toward them and their specific needs. Um, so these are the ways, some of the ways in which within the IGNITE project, we have been trying to be more accountable toward children, but also more accountable toward local organizations. Um, and as the project is still in its early phases, uh, we really look forward to sharing more learnings with you on how it unfolds. Um, yes. I think I will stop here. Thank you, Joanna, for the question. No, super. Thank you for the different components of your answer. And I think we're all going to be looking forward to seeing how this progresses, in particular that co-creation and that co-design that your, some of your local partners uh, have taken on board. That's great. So we're going to zoom out a few steps and go, uh, look at the legal system in a different, um, in a different setting, which is Nigeria. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Mercy Okichinda to come on up. She is a lecturer uh, at the law faculty at the University of Port Harcourt in Nigeria. She holds a PhD of law from the University of Manchester and is a barrister and solicitor of the Supreme Court of Nigeria. You want to be up here? Sure. Um, but on top of that, uh, Mercy is also has a degree in mass communications and was a journalist for 16 years. So she brings a number of different perspectives uh, to her discussion of uh, building more accountable legal systems uh, for IDP girls who have survived sexual and gender-based violence. There you go. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I, the past um, two days has been a deluge of um, information. I will take time out after now to begin to process them. But for today, the reason why I'm here, I'm going to be talking about protection of girls. So protecting conflict-induced, internally displaced um, girls from sexual violence in Nigeria. Um, before I begin, let me make some clarifications. Um, the conflict I'm referring to here now uh, that I'll be discussing is the Boko Haram conflict. For those of us who are conversant, with what is going on in Nigeria, we know that for over a decade, we have been battling with the Boko Haram crisis. And then my reference to girls here does not also mean that uh, sexual violence has been exclusively um, meted out on girls. Women suffer the same thing. And then we have boys also. But my um, attention to girls is because of the proportionality. So that's why I'm paying attention to girls. And so in the last um, a decade and a half, in the last 15 years, we've been battling with the problem of Boko Haram. And one major feature of this terrorist uh, group is the abduction of girls. And from the abduct abduction also follows high rates of sexual violence. So it's not just um, the issue of number. We know that so many, um, it has caused mass displacement and placed Nigeria on the map as one of the countries with the highest number of displacees. More worrisome is the criminal acts that go on, the abductions, the sexual violence, and all those that follow. And um, that follow the, the act activities of the terrorists, and then the counter-insurgency crusade of the government. And then the entire silence around the issue. And so this is what has inspired this work. First of all, I'm going to be mapping the nexus between the Boko Haram uh, crisis and sexual violence. From the foundation of late, the, the terrorist action of the Boko Haram and the counterinsurgency crusade has led to mass displacement. And so there is rape, there is um, a sexual assault from when the communities are sacked to when they go, um, when they are when in flight, and then till they arrive the camps. 
And in the camp, it is not just um, the Boko Haram alone. So the gravity of the problem of sexual violence of female displacees is what has inspired this discussion. And so the conflict between the insurgents and government forces has over years given rise to high rates of internal displacement. And so protecting women by this conflict has been challenging both to the government and um, to non-governmental organizations. The government sees the, the issue of sexual violence as a lesser problem, a lesser issue com compared to the counter-insurgency crusade. So these girls, even after the violation, they are left on their own. It's as if nothing is happening. And because of the culture of silence surrounding these issues, even family members won't want them to talk about it because of the um, stigmatization and the justice system isn't also helping. And so the, the Boko Haram crisis has led to high level of violence. And then we have the legal protection of conflict-induced internally displaced girls against sexual violence. That all this is going on does not mean that Nigeria does not have a robust body of laws. We have laws that should protect girls from um, sexual violence generally. And in the course of this work, let me also pause to clarify. Some have asked this question, why do we have to make IDPs, that's the internally displaced persons, as a category of concern? After all, they are citizens. They have not left the borders. They are still within the borders. And so their citizens, the laws that apply to citizens should apply to them. However, the case is not the same. Because for um, migration, as we know, displacement comes with a lot, another layer of vulnerability that expose them right from um, when they leave home and then arrive at the shanties where they call camps. And so the laws are there, the applicable laws are there, but these laws do not capture effectively the experience of the displacees. If we look at the legal framework, we have laws that criminalize rape. We have laws that criminalize um, uh, sexual abuse and humiliation. But these laws have traditional definitions that do not capture the experience of the displacees. Because sexual violence and abuse in displacement camps does not only come in the traditional manner that we know it. Some are made to dance naked, some are made to commit incest, some are made to do things that are not captured in the laws. And we know, I am happy that most of us here are lawyers and we know about um, how crime, the definition of a crime, the elements of a crime impact on the prosecution of that crime. So based on the issue of legality, the, the, the definition that we have about sexual violence in our laws do not exactly, are not effective to capture the problems faced by IDPs. And so the laws exist. We have um, a constitution that outlaws, uh, uh, that provides for the right, for the dignity of the human person. We have also the uh, CRLA, the uh, Child's Rights Act, which also criminalizes sexual abuse on children. We have the criminal code that uh, is operative or operational in the, in the southern part of the country and the penal code for, we operate two um, criminal codes in Nigeria, the penal code for the north, the criminal code for the south. And these instruments provide an outlaw sexual violence. However, as I mentioned, they do not particularly capture the experience of the displacees. And then beyond that, we also have international and regional instruments that um, Nigeria has ratified that should provide some form of protection for internally displaced persons. Africa has the only regional instrument, legal instrument, um, for the protection and assistance of internally displaced persons. And that is the convention, African Union Convention on the Protection and Assistance of Internally Displaced Persons, otherwise called the Kampala Convention. It makes robust provisions for the protection of IDPs. And thankfully, Nigeria has ratified that instrument. However, we still have an impediment in our laws. In section 12 of our laws of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, um, international um, conventions, treaties, 
that are ratified by Nigeria, even if ratified, consent to be bound given, does not make the laws operational in Nigeria. We run a dualist constitution. And so unless the National Assembly passes those um, treaties into laws, they will not be regarded as laws in Nigeria, even if those laws have been ratified. And the way the system works, there has been this, um, I, I, I do, will I call it a kind of hypocrisy concerning um, treaties that have been ratified. So far, even look at CEDAW, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women was ratified by Nigeria in 1985. But up to this moment as we speak, it has not been um, incorporated into our laws. The same thing goes for the Maputo Convention. That is the African Women, um, uh, pr the protocol for the protection of women in Africa. It has been ratified long ago, but it has not been incorporated into our laws. And these two key instruments, the Kampala Convention provides for protection of women acknowledging the particular situation and circumstance of internally displaced persons. Also, the Maputo Protocol makes provisions for the protection of women in flight, women and girls in flight. But these instruments, unfortunately, have not been incorporated into our laws, so they are just there. But recently, in 2015, we had an improvement in our laws when um, the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act was passed into law in Nigeria. We were all hopeful because it made elaborate provisions. It expanded the definition beyond the traditional definition that uh, we're struggling with in the criminal code and the penal code. There again, there is a problem because the Violence Against Persons Prosecution Act can, is only justiciable in the Federal Capital Territory, Abuja, the, federal high, the courts of the Federal um, Capital Territory. Some states, like my state, uh, we, um, some states have um, incorporated those, uh, the act as laws in their various states, some, because it's the federal system, but some have not. And even if they do, IDPs are located in very remote areas. So there again arises the problem of access to justice. So they're there in remote areas, they cannot access the courts. And even if they desire to do so, they're in pecuniosity. Because remember, these are people that more largely have lost you know, their means of livelihood because of the flight. And so they're thinking of basic issues of life. They're thinking of food. They're thinking of shelter. They're thinking of water. So the last thing on their minds will be what um, going to proceed against the perpetrators. And what does this do? It, it creates... Um, it creates um, it, it enhances and enhances impunity because the perpetrators know that you're not going to do anything. Nothing is going to happen. The government isn't doing anything about it. The IDPs are too poor to, to do anything. In fact, in some cases, the parents of the girls that have been abused to avoid stigmatization marry off these girls to the perpetrators because no one wants to talk about it. And so, um, even if we have rights, rights are colored by culture. And it's also working against the IDPs because that's the culture, that's the general culture of silence. We don't want to talk about it. And when you talk about the, um, go further to talk about access to justice. First of all, the laws are not there. In spite of the massive, massive displacement in Nigeria, we do not have any law specifically for the protection of IDPs. And there is no dedicated institution for the protection of IDPs. So you have fragmented efforts, you know, different groups trying to do what they can do for IDPs. And so, let me round off, please. So um, there is no law, there is no dedicated institution. And the, the government seems not to be ready. It's like, um, I, I wouldn't say it's overwhelming for them. The government seems to be unwilling because it's, it's not seen as a problem. Then the um, officials, the law enforcement officials, do not also see it as a big issue. So it's difficult. It's either they are not prepared for it or they have not come to see it as an issue to be given attention. So these are the various problems and challenges that IDPs face 
especially the girls, when it comes to issues of sexual violence. Thank you, Mercy. I think we have some questions for you now that you've laid out so well the, the framework, the situation. Yes, I do have one question. Thank you, Mercy. This was really insightful to know that despite all the comprehensive um, legal framework that exists, there are still so many gaps and um, the reality is different from the law. Um, I wanted to ask you, because we, within Ignite, we, we work with local actors and local organizations. I wanted to ask you, based on your research and your findings, are there any best practices, any ways, innovative ways in which local organizations, local actors can achieve more accountability toward um, IDP girls or girls in general, and maybe learnings that we can share across not only in Africa, but also in Latin America? Thank you. Thank you, Senida. Yeah, in the course of my work, I've seen because um, I didn't follow um, how I prepared it, but um, my work, in the course of my work, I've been able to identify areas that we can bridge, gaps that we can plug. Just because the government is not willing doesn't mean that it is the end of the road. We also have um, non-governmental bodies. We have um, local groups that can assist in ensuring that these girls have protection. First of all, um, they can push for a law, an IDP law. Yes, we have the problem of implementation. And some will ask, why more laws when the ones we have are not implemented? But for me, I believe that for issues like this, we begin with the law. Let there be a law first to reference. Let there be a law first to reference, and then we we'll move on to the issue of non-implementation, non-enforcement, and all those. So they can push for first for the right thing to be done. And what is that right thing to be done? Let there be a law protecting IDPs. Not all of them are poor. Not all of them, and there are legal, legal aid um, organizations that can also assist, but let there be a law for people to work on. Secondly, they can also go into advocacy, advocacy, push the government and also enlighten the people. Because, you know, some of these uh, persons, yes, they are citizens. But because of the way they are treated and how they've come to begin to perceive themselves, they regard themselves as second class citizens and they feel that the law justice is too distant a thing for them. And so some they even say it like they deserve to suffer this way. That is their lot in life. So if they are enlightened to know that look, the law does exist and this is a crime. So there is no limitation of time. And then we have, thankfully, there is the FREP, that is the Fundamental Rights Enforcement Procedure a, a rule in Nigeria. It must not be the person involved that will approach the courts. Issues like this, NGOs can also approach the courts in, on, on behalf of the victim. Also, for local actors, I, I would also say that we shouldn't always be reactionary we should be proactive about it like not just wait for these girls to become victims and then we come out to act some are damaged beyond repair or therapy so we we don't wait for that and then they could also collaborate you don't just say i will do my own thing and i have all the solution it's not it's not it doesn't happen that way we have different groups, some are lawyers who have come together, some are non-lawyers, you know, doing different things. So we could leverage, they could leverage the strength of other groups. What you don't have, I have. What you can do, I, you know, I can do so. Fantastic, lots of examples of ways that we can work together and also a link to the previous session that was in the room about prevention. We must not wait for girls to experience sexual violence, IDP girls to experience sexual violence, but looking at ways we can prevent it and hold the systems accountable to keep children safe. 
Thank you, Marcy. We are going to ask our third speaker to come up. Uh, Daniela Esguera Suarez is a political scientist who specialized in feminist and gender studies at the National University of Colombia. She is currently head of advocacy uh, in Colombia for World Vision International. There she works on protection and gender in humanitarian response. And her approach is to develop strategies for migrant, refugee and host populations to access and restore their rights. So Daniela is going to speak about developing response mechanisms for unaccompanied and separated children on the move and how those mechanisms can be more uh, accountable to the children we're aiming to serve. Daniela. Thank you very much. I would like to start by sharing the experience that we have in World Vision Colombia, developing this project, a project that has given us the input so we can respond to a fundamental question. And the question is how? How can we protect children? And in World Vision Colombia, we developed this experience throughout three years. I'm sure that there will be many more. And this experience has given us the products to protect the most vulnerable migrating children. And here we talk about unaccompanied and separated children. And one of our main actions has been developing elements to mitigate the risks of children and adolescents. And we have found them migrating throughout the route and sometimes becoming permanent. In this slide, you can see the map of Colombia. And what you see in orange are the areas uh, where right now the project is being developed and uh, these are areas where we identified migrating children or unaccompanied and separated children or children at risks. And here we talk about the host community. And it is important to consider the risk mitigation through the development of uh, friendly spaces or child or children friendly spaces, spaces where they can take a break Second, they can find a place uh, to be themselves uh, because uh, many of them throughout the route need to assume the responsibility of caring for their siblings or other people and family members. And they do not have the possibility to find a space uh, for recreation. And this is also an opportunity to gain information about what's to come and the risks uh, throughout the route. We also carried out uh, case management actions. And for us, case management has been crucial, allowing us uh, to hear the voices of children. In that sense, we can recognize their needs, their vulnerabilities, and we can learn what they think we can do as actors in the civil society to respond to their needs to accompany the development process so we can offer them well-being. And the psychosocial accompaniment has been a fundamental tool to identify the best interest for the children and adolescents, being able to listen to them and identify their interests had given us the elements to say that many of them will come back together or reunite with their families. We have identified more than 2,000 children, unaccompanied and separated children. Many of them are from Venezuela, but we have also identified other nationalities. 60% of them had been able to access uh, to some kind of protection services among them institutional services and also the services that we can provide from the civil society. 
and only 7% of them had been able to reunite with their families. So, so the question is, what are we doing with the rest of children that cannot go back to their families or reunite with their families? So, so the case management, psychosocial support, and all the services that we have been able to provide to children and adolescents, and of course, unaccompanied children uh, have been fundamental. And we have been able to coordinate with other sectors, understanding that our framework is protection. And in this case, child protection. We need to find a way to interact with the services uh, in other sectors like cash, livelihood, and tools, uh, for example, like through vouchers and humanitarian uh, transportation, we can help the reunification working with competent authorities and also working with the livelihood sector to find a way out for children once they go back to their families. How can we prevent future scenarios of family separation? Because what we see throughout the route is that they start mobilizing by themselves only because they need to find a better stability, a better socioeconomic reality. And once uh, they go to their families, uh, they have to leave their family setting again. And in this case, it is important to have dialogues like the ones that we have had this week. We need to, to mainstream this approach of child protection in all sectors because children need a comprehensive response. And this is a crucial challenge. Sometimes uh, we think from sectorial boxes and we need to think out of the box. We need to listen to children. Accountability is important. We need to work with different sections in the response for children. And it is important to advocate, to collaborate with partners not only those partners in the civil society, but also government entities and community-based organizations and faith-based organizations. They have become and they are key actors. I could speak about the destinations and where they are moving to in Latin America. Uh, some of them have the intention to move to North and Central America, but case management has allowed us uh, to listen to them and provide a response that gathers the, the voices and the best interest of children. Well, <laughs> thank you so much, Daniela. And I think you've spoken really well to how our child protection system you know, needs to be integrated with other sectors as we build an effective response for children, as we listen to what they tell us they need, and we try to provide it. If not for that individual child who may have moved on in their journey, then to somewhat the collective children who are passing through your roots. So I like to always remind myself of hope and the helpers. So I'm wondering which actors you have found to be supportive. Maybe you were surprised by certain actors who have been supportive to the changes you want to see in the formal and informal child protection systems along the migratory route. And then maybe realistically, who has not been so supportive to your advocacy? Sí, bueno, lo primero para decir es que eh, en Colombia, well, in Colombia, we were not ready uh, to become a host country. In fact, due to the socio-political, economic, and cultural uh, realities we had, we had a lot of internal displacement uh, due to the forced displacement uh, because of the armed conflict. So facing the migration crisis, especially people coming from Venezuela, uh, brought challenges, but also brought opportunities, opportunities to work. And the work that community-based organizations and faith-based organizations did 
was important to create formal systems to protect the children. We wanted to, well, seeing children walking through the routes without being able to provide any type of assistance from these community settings. After this, and I believe that to us in Colombia, the pandemic uh, was a fundamental moment because we needed to offer formal responses. And facing that, it is important to recognize that we have advanced our formal systems. And some of the experiences of practices with the Colombian uh, Institute is in charge of ensuring the rights of children in Colombia. Because we gather experiences of everything that was happening with community organizations and everything became formal. Uh, there were binational agreements. For example, in November 2023, there was an agreement between the Venezuelan and the Colombian government for caring and protecting children, unaccompanied children that are part of the protection systems. And the Colombian children under the uh, Colombian protection system and the Venezuelan children in the route that are part of the Colombian protection system. So we needed to connect those systems in a formal way at the international level. Recently, there was an agreement between Panama and Colombia as to what to do in order to protect the children and the plans the state have for the protection routes and the transit that we see of children through the Darien. Creating these measures has been a step forward in Colombia and the bylaw of a temporary protection for migrant people coming from Venezuela has been important as well for the Colombian government. Working hand in hand with the civil society. We need to continue working with community-based organizations, and we need to continue working on this social fabric, working with communities, and we need to focus on localization. This is something that we have mentioned throughout these days. Indeed, we have. Thank you. And Daniela, I really appreciate, I mean, using Colombia as an example, Colombia, Venezuela, Colombia, Panama, that you've shown us how activism, act, advocacy, drawing lessons help push our governments to be more accountable to children. And that's what many of us in the room do. Professor um, Okichinda has pointed to the gaps in the Nigerian legal system, but there have been some gaps filled over the last 10, 20 years. And that's because of activism, that's because of the efforts that you in the room and, and our speakers on the stage make. Uh, we are not in the same position as we were 10 years ago or 20 years ago. So let us remember some of the progress that we have made as well in pushing systems to better protect children and to be accountable to what children need and tell us they need. So I'm going to ask Renier to bring up some questions from the floor. But while he does that, um, I'm wanting to ask all of you, one of the themes that connect you is your commitment to adolescent girls and your drive to see um, uh, more accountability to adolescent girls. And I'm wondering to, to ask you, what is the importance to each of you uh, of this population? Yeah, um, accountability is critical because without it, it will just be mere rhetoric. It will be all fury without result. So if there is accountability, we know that justice will be served there will be deterrence. There will be deterrence. When a perpetrator knows that he won't go scot free, just like the situation is now, they are not emboldened. Impunity is taken out and justice is saved. And they're not the part of the victim. The victim is also emboldened. You see, most victims don't come out to talk because when they come out to talk, they are shamed, they are traumatized again. 
and they know that they're not expecting justice. Nothing is going to come out of it. So they rather stay back with the little dignity remaining. But if there is accountability, they will be emboldened to come out. Well, uh, accountability is fundamental because it allows us uh, to put the voice of the children at the center of the actions we carry out. And uh, this uh, brings uh, challenges. Maybe we need to get uncomfortable a little. We need to get detached from the conventional responses where we talk and think about protection and lab livelihood and participation. And we face the need to think on innovative responses, comprehensive responses that put at the center the children. Therefore, I believe that this is a call for everyone to advocate. So the responses and the construction of our programs and projects also try to advance in innovative responses that children need. And maybe we could uh, step out of conventional uh, systems that we have. And with that, we have tools, we have learnings, and we can continue building these together with a more regional approach. This is what we see it's necessary for children. Um, thank you, Joanna, for this question. This is something that I uh, hold very dear to my heart. Um, so for me, I think accountability to adolescent girls is crucial because of the different vulnerabilities and the very specific needs that they have that oftentimes tend to be overlooked by child protection actors who would tend to focus sometimes on younger children and also by GBV or women protection actors who will tend to focus on women. And because of these compounded discriminations that they face as being both children but also being females, they tend to fall through the cracks of both child protection activities and GBV activities. Um, so for me, I think it is really crucial that when we're talking about accountability to children, we really focus on adolescent girls and we really ensure that we're engaging them so that they can share um, what they are living in their different contexts, um, especially in humanitarian crisis where sometimes the system breaks down, the child protection system are weakened um, and they are the one who are oftentimes the most affected. Um, um, so yes, I think um, within IGNITE, this is something that we have been really trying to do to prioritize, yes, to prioritize um, working with uh, youth-led organizations, working with girl-led organizations that are working for adolescent girls and with them by providing them the space to really share their lives and sh share with us how we can support them. Thank you. Thank you all three for sharing that, sharing your passion, showing your commitment uh, to this population group. Um, we have your questions from the beginning of the session. Rania has been organizing them into some different themes. Do you want to summarize one of them? Yes. Yeah. Sure. I'll try. I do a very hard job because everything's so interesting and addressing a lot and trying to focus on things that not coming up into now. And I have a question for Daniela, Mercy, and Senedia. Uh, for Mercy, um, you are talking about uh, the gaps that we are uh, talking about your country and the experiences that we are sharing, but how, um, how do you shift the accountability for children uh, to consider the, the responsibility uh, of everybody, you know, not consider a whole society. How can you shift this responsibility to have to listen to children as a part of the every building society answers that we are addressing for children? If I thank you very much, Renia. If I got you correctly, you're asking how everyone can be involved and be responsible. Yeah, it's, it's a collective thing. 
it's not, it's not just, um, we talk about the government a lot because um, the government, mainly you, you can't extricate law from politics, right? And so the government, there has to be the poli political will to drive all these that we're talking about. But irrespective of the role of the government, which is critical, every facet of the society also has a role to play. Parents have a role to play. Teachers have their own role to play. The children themselves also. That's why we have to get them involved. And um, uh, they also have their roles to play as children. Parents have their roles to play, different sectors of the society, even um, our leaders, you know, um, community heads and all those. We all have our roles to play. It's not just um, something that is unilateral or something that we should leave to the government alone to do. Okay, thank you. It's very inspiring, very, very sharing responsibility with everybody in order to build a better society for children. Uh, Senidia, um, there is a quite very, I think it's um, interesting question around uh, what are the children, especially the girls, are asking or saying or demanding related to accountability for children. There is any particular or interested request for them? Yes, um, thank you. So within Ignite, we, we have been the, the local organizations have been consulting girls when they were designing the projects. Um, and one of the things that kept on coming is really um, how we can work with, because it's mostly an education project, but girls have really asked us how we can work with education actors um, so that um, like they work with the parents um, and they can really enforce um, their projection, for instance, one thing that kept coming is like a child, um, child abuse at school, how their violence against children uh, when they are at schools, the GBV on the way, um, and how it's not only that we provide them with material support for them to go to school, but also we have to work with the, ch the teachers, we have to work with the parents so that um, when they are at home, they have time to study. And when they are at school, um, the teachers are not um, being abusive toward them, especially girls. And the teacher is providing them with um, the opportunity to learn, uh, like they are providing boys with the opportunity to learn. So that is something that really came is having the integrated approach, working with other actors uh, in education to ensure that we're really serving girls the best way that we can. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Danny, um, in order to be very quickly, um, how can we ensure a deep and significant participation of a children on displaced children in humanitarian context, especially considering the funding that is not working or not moving at the same speed as the people being displaced? Well, I believe this is one of the main challenges we have when we accompany children throughout the programs. And we have two main opportunities. One, there is an opportunity to work through all the different activities and the little time we get with them throughout the route. At any time, I believe that we work on accountability or at least we listen to children and we include children in all the activities, in every single process. If we get five minutes with them throughout the route, we can try to raise awareness and we can talk about risks. These are five minutes so we can get to learn about their needs. They come to our centers to receive everything we can give them or everything we have planned in our frameworks, but they also want a space to be heard. And every minute is important. And we need a constant uh, systemization. We need to manage the knowledge. This is crucial. So their voices in those uh, 10, 15, 20 minutes or the time we get with them, it's important. They will continue. And as the children continue, 
those are left behind are us. So from the systemization and through the active listening, after considering potential responses and considering that as a baseline for the needs in order to create programs and projects that actually put the voices of the children at the center, I believe that is our responsibility. This is our task, and we need to bring this uh, to decision makers. Thank you. I'm learning from you guys how important it is learn children, especially girls, children in the movement, in order to uh, design frameworks, legal frameworks, in order to design local programming for children on the move ar around the humanitarian response, but also uh, listen to children to improve our approach with them in order to address their needs, especially. Thanks for sharing. Super, thanks for those questions from the floor and, and for the answer. And, and Danielle, I think you touched on that piece that we have children's participation, but accountability is the next step. So what do we do with that information? How do we come back to the children and tell them what we have done? Some success, some not, not yet success, some outright failure, and then continue to have a dialogue. And when it is on the move, when children are displaced and when children age out, it may not always be the same child or the same 10 children, but that we, we, as far as possible, come back to a child, but we continue on with that population group and continue to have that, not only dialogue, but that um, responsibility to move on what they've tell us they need. Um, we have some time for other questions from the floor now that you've heard from our speakers. Um, there's a question back here. Gracias. Eh, sí, más es una reflexión. Only two times I was able to hear about rights in the international protection system. I believe important to work with intention through our actions when we work with the uh, international protection system. Because yes, we have the civil society, we work at the local level, community level, and national level, and uh, we usually share different approaches that contribute uh, to the children's protection, but we see that this is enough. We need the state to be the main safeguarding entity so we can actually see the impact. Otherwise, we will invest and carry out studies, but we won't see any impact. We won't see changes in the context of the country. The government needs to be accountable, but they can be accountable and they can also submit reports at the international level because we are part of the international protection system. So we need to use the resources that the international justice system offers. In Africa, for example, uh, has an international uh, human rights protection system. We also have it in Latin America and in other continents. And making use of the mechanisms that we already have in the international system. For example, uh, visiting the rapporteurs and we need to use the resources so we can put some pressure at a different level. Let's not work only at the local or national level because it's a struggle. We need to be there constantly and dealing with a lot of issues. And many times uh, we feel demotivated or we feel tired, but we need, take to, we need to take that leap so we can actually see that uh, the state needs to be the main safeguarding entity, and not out of their own will, but actually because this is their duty. So our colleague on the floor was talking about how um, it's not only at local level or at national level that we need to push and advocate, but we need to be using international frameworks and international forums, human rights commissions, um, or, or reports to uh, CEDAW or reports to the CRC Commission to make pressure on our government because our governments are the duty bearers for the protection of children and accountability to the citizens, in our case children, uh, and residents even uh, in their territories. So. Thank you for sharing. 
maybe joining or adding to the last comment, I would like to talk about the creation of guarantees that we need in the countries, even though there are agreements or treaties, that doesn't necessarily mean that there is a guarantee in the countries. And we have seen, based on the experience shared by Daniela and the different barriers to access to justice, there is a difficulty when protection systems do not have the same conditions. Therefore, there is a context in Venezuela where it's going to be hard to speak about strengthening the systems where there is a lot of resistance uh, for the participation and uh, the guaranteeing of those working on human rights. When we speak on the context of Colombia where the impunity case connected to sexual abuse is higher than 90%, we can see that the challenges are wide because the conflict, because of the different actors. Uh, well, shedding light into this problematic needs to connect to the different elements. There are too many challenges. There is progress. We have experiences and it is important to connect what's happening in the field so we can continue moving forward and strengthening the system that wants to leverage from other spaces and then bring it down to the local so it doesn't create a risk for the population itself. Thank you. Hello, from the government side, I take responsibility from everything I heard. Okay, I think this is important, especially for accountability. And I would like to share a case that it's still a challenge in Mexico. The migrant uh, caravans, I believe that accountability is important because of the intervention of different actors, especially in the south of Mexico. But we face the challenge of the participation uh, framework. How can we make these strategies or methodologies to reach all the actors in a situation that is very, well, this is an emerging situation in the case of uh, the caravans in the south, from Mexico to Guatemala even. I think that what happens in the national and international level, how can we address these aspects? Somehow this is being addressed by the Mexican government when we try to move into human rights of people in mobility. However, I believe that, well, these, these topics are focused on these cases. There is a need to act quickly on these types of aspects and topics. Thank you. There's one more here, okay. but maybe the, we've had a lot of reflections about the challenges and mm, the need yeah. to, the different entry points we have to put pressure on the systems that need to change, which m often lie at the, the national government level. And I think if I understood correctly, the last speaker, um, government has different layers as well in most of the countries in which we work. We have state and we have federal. Um, and so even within government is not homogeneous. It is, there's not only one, we, we hope we are working with the right level of government, but they have limitations that, you know, that there are challenges also that they face at another level. I don't know if anyone wants to speak to that dynamic. Yeah, um, on the first um, issue raised about government being the duty bearer. Yes, yeah, states are actually the subjects, main subjects of international law. And the whole essence of treaties is also to come in to fill the gap when um, the local laws are not sufficient to protect the people. But um, a major problem that I've seen in the course of research and from experience is that, let me speak from my own area. When you begin to see, after um, assenting, giving, ratifying treaties, and those treaties are not owned by the people, they see it as an imposition, even after ratifying. It's difficult for them to implement it. And some also uh, do not suit the local circumstance of the people. That's why even in making laws, making regulations and policies, they also have to consider the local circumstance of the people. And that's why like um, we run a federal system. If there is um, a law, a federal act, act of parliament, as the states take 
um, turn them, incorporate them into laws in the various regions. Local circumstances are also acknowledged as long as it doesn't touch the object and purpose of that particular instrument. So it's, it's important that after these laws or treaties are uh, ratified, they should also be owned and tuned to suit the local circumstance. Then there is another problem when it comes to human rights issues, as we're discussing. Um, how do we hold the government accountable when they do not implement their own part of the agreement in the treaties. For, for, for a long time, it's been naming and shaming, and I don't think that has been effective in you know, getting governments to, to comply with what they have assented to. So I think it also calls for other measures you know, to aid accountability, so that these governments, as you ratify, you're responsible enough to also implement what you have assented to. Well, the experience that we have had with uh, unaccompanied and separated children is in Colombia, but in general, for Latin America and Colombia specifically, we can start talking about how the local governments identified unaccompanied and separated children, because in Colombia precisely, we were not a host country, so that was not a reality for us. And being able to map this situation brought this problem into the scenario when the government asked, what are we going to do with this? And after that, there was a long path ahead that required for us to ask, how are we going to receive them? Who's going to care for them? What is going to be the response? And after that, maybe at a different level and in different times, because I believe that it is important to acknowledge that Mexico's and Brazil's experience started before. Our experience started maybe with the pandemic, and this is where everything becomes a little bit more visible, referring to children in vulnerable situations. But I know this has been happening for a while. and. This allows the advocacy to be strong so the state can start making decisions at the national level. And just like Claudia mentioned, the government and government entities' challenges are still pretty big at the national level. However, progress means that we need to work in tables and create dialogues and communicate with other governments at the regional level. And even though there are implementation challenges, what we see is that there is a window of opportunity, a window of opportunity to bring the voices of the children to start generating responses, responses that are actually listening to their needs, because it's not only about giving a response, but it's also important to hear about their needs. So this is something that in Colombia we still need to work on because we do not have restitution measures that gather the needs of the migrant children. There are measures for Colombian children specifically, yes, but this window of opportunity is important. This is a constant advocacy it's been hard work and this will allow us to connect the children's voices so this response can actually be offered based on what they need based on what we need and maybe that first unaccompanied child that crossed in 2015 or 2018 maybe has different conditions in a different country but for those children that are yet to come, we have different situations, we have different standards, we have different responses. And it is unfortunate to think that maybe we cannot give these children everything they need. But what we can say is that we have a responsibility to that first child that came through our country. and. For the next child that crosses by, 
now we will be able to give a different response, uh, something closer to their needs. And I think this is also related to accountability. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to hold the questions there, even though I think there was one more from the floor. And uh, just put one last question or request to each of you, which is in one minute, what would you say, what would you recommend to colleagues here in order to um, move forward, in order to ensure more accountability to adolescent girls in humanitarian settings? Sinedia, you're next to me. I'll put you on the spot first. All right, in one minute, I will try to do even less. Um, so for me, I would say really working, um, I guess this is also a call for localization, but really working with women's rights organizations, with um, youth led organizations that are closer to the communities, that are embedded within the communities, that are able to connect more easily with girls, with children. They know the nuances of their context and really supporting them in engaging girls and working um, for girls and children in general um, so that they can better serve um, children. So that's it. For me, I'll just leave three words, um, more collaboration. Um, response is not a one size uh, fits all. And so each case will be treated uh, as you know, given a personal touch. That's why we talk about needs assessments and all those. Then, um, thirdly, what I mentioned when I was talking about um, my research, my advice to um, also local groups, it's be more proactive rather than wait for a life to be destroyed before we begin to procure or prescribe um, solution so it's good to be more um, give attention more to prevention and early intervention we have an important task uh, we need to build the social fabric and we need to strengthen community-based organizations and localization is crucial we have an important task. We must continue the advocacy. So our advocacy ends up with binding processes so we can hear the voices of children. We have a responsibility. We must create programs and projects that can include all the experiences and the baggages that uh, we acquired in the first process. From this, uh, we can build something into the future where children finally feel received and heard. Super, thank you each. Um, thank you for working with me for putting together this panel. Um, thank you for your continued work in your various um, places of work and communities with which you work. Thank you for your careers and your training that has brought you here to share your expertise with us. It's very much appreciated. Um, thank you everyone in the audience for sticking with us uh, right up to lunchtime. Uh, we have a break now for an hour. Um, and then I believe we go back. Uh, you can choose which of the groups that you follow up at two o'clock. So thank you so much.